one of Ajahn Suat's favorite Dharma talks or Dharma topics was the practice of the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. He picked this up from Ajahn Mun. He said it was one of Ajahn Mun's favorite topics. We tend to think of the forest tradition as being very Thai. But when Ajahn Mun was getting out into the forest, along with Ajahn Sao, he was very controversial. Ajahn Cha talks about how families would be split over whether they supported Ajahn Mun or village monks. Because the way Ajahn Mun practiced, the way Ajahn Sao practiced, had very little in common with the way ordinary village monks would practice eating one meal a day out of the bowl, living in the forest, meditating a lot, not being doctors to the local populace. And the gentleman was criticized. His response always was, if you want to be a noble one, you have to practice in line the way the noble ones practiced. You're talking about the customs of the noble ones, but also saying that you would have to take your thoughts and your words and your deeds and bring them in line with the Dharma. So many of us do that as we go through the day. A thought comes into the mind, do you ask yourself, is this in line with the Dharma or is it something else? Or do you just go with it? You've got to realize that you've got to make yourself Dhamma if you're willing to get the most out of the practice. That means every thought that comes into the mind, you've got to scrutinize it. Where is this going to lead? If you get casual about some of your thoughts, then that attitude of casualness begins to spread. It takes up more thoughts and then it starts eating into your meditation time. You've got to regard all day as meditation time. And John Fu made this comment one time. He said, we're looking for a dharma that's a galiko, as we chant day in, day out, one that's not subject to time. And yet our practice has times. This is the time to meditate. This is the time to eat. This is the time to sweep around the monastery. This is the time to work in the kitchen, as if they weren't related. You've got to have the attitude that all the time is practice time, while you're in the kitchen, while you're in sweeping around. Keep watch over your mind, because that's how the drama is found, through commitment and reflection. Just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, and then notice what's actually happening. And learning how to know when the times are that you're going to put the mind on a long leash and when you're going to put it on a short leash. The long leash are times when the mind is thinking things that are actually useful, or things that are harmless. When it starts thinking of things in ways that are not going to be good for your practice, sensual desire, ill will, these are the two big ones, out of the hindrances. It's because of essential desire that we were born here. That's what's going to underlie a lot of our thoughts. You have to be especially careful about that. I remember one night when Ajahn Swat was teaching body contemplation. He just went through the whole skeleton, starting through the bones and the toes. And then up to the bones and the feet, and then the bones and the ankles, and the bones and the shins, like that old song. But he did it very slowly, section by section by section. Then he started talking about the things that were inside, say, the, the rib cage, 
encased by the rib cage. The other parts of the body that the bones were keeping erect. It was very graphic. So it's good to be graphic in your contemplation of the body. Ask yourself, what in there is worthy of lust? What in there is worthy of pride? Learn how to have that thought ready at hand. So when thoughts of lust come up, you've got something to deal with them. As for ill will, we usually don't like to think of ourselves as having ill will for anybody. But the mind does have this tendency to say, so-and-so deserves to be punished, so-and-so deserves to get their karmic rewards fast. And even though we may think of that as righteous anger or as justice, still you're wishing harm on people. Think of Angulimala. killed hundreds of people, and justice would have been served if he'd been executed. But the Buddha had something better, release. He could see that Ongulimala had the potential, and so he taught him, ordained him. The king recognized him as a monk, and so he didn't inflict any punishment. People were upset. I'm sure there were people who had lost their relatives to him. And so when he was going his arms around, people would throw things at him. But as the Buddha said, it was minor compared to what he would have suffered if he hadn't gained awakening. So wishing karmic retribution on people is not the Buddha's way of doing things. He noticed that's the way the world is, but his way was against the way of the world. No matter how much you may deserve to suffer, quote unquote, he's got a way out. As he said, if all our karmic consequences had to be served before we gain awakening, nobody would ever gain awakening. So the Noble Eightfold Path is an escape clause. And so when you think of people doing harm in the world, the best attitude would be one of, may they find the Dharma, may they appreciate it, see the error of their ways, and change their ways. Because when people change their ways from their own recognition of what they've done wrong, that's the best way. That's the change of heart that really lasts. The change of heart that comes when you're being punished may last for a while, but sometimes some people will resist even that. So have these antidotes to your big hindrances and have them ready all the time. Because the hindrances aren't hindrances only when you're sitting in meditation or when you're doing walking meditation. They're hindrances whenever they come up. And our problem is that we see them as our friends at some times. They are entertainment during our time off from the practice. And if you take that kind of time off, it pretty much erases the, the good that you've done during your meditation. So the drama is timeless. And to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, you have to make your practice timeless. We are not to gobble down pleasures. After all, the practice of the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma is for the sake of disenchantment, which is the opposite of eating. And so the mind has had enough of things, doesn't want to eat anymore. And the kind of disenchantment that leads to dispassion when the mind grows up and it's tired of playing around with fabrications. At the time as you mature as a go from childhood to your 
adolescence, you look back at your childhood games and say, those are stupid. That's dispassion. That's the kind of attitude we want to practice for. So see the practice as an all-day affair. And that's when it's a dharma in accordance with the dharma. Timeless and to be understood by those who are wise. In other words, when you have the wisdom of dispassion, that's when you really know what the dharma is about. <laughs>